Hi, this is Steve from Law Firm Suites. Every year in my own law practice, I like to go over where exactly the revenue in my law firm came from during the previous year, and based on the trends that I find in this data, I make informed decisions about what marketing activities will make the most productive use of my limited marketing time. In the previous video in this series, I showed you how you could set up a spreadsheet to track revenue by client and revenue by referral source, the basis for this review. You can find that video on Law Firm Suite's YouTube channel, and if you haven't already watched it, I recommend that you start there. In this video, I'm going to show you how I used Excel pivot tables to drill down on some of this data and some of the particular reports that I find very useful in my own law practice. I'll actually be walking you through real data from my law firm from back in 2008, which was a critical year for our corporate law practice, and one where we made significant changes to our marketing strategy based on our review of 2008 numbers. So let's get started. Okay, in the first video, I showed you the four tab workbook in Excel that I used to examine revenue sources for my firm when doing our year end marketing review. So far, we've looked primarily at the first tab of the workbook, which is where we entered all of the data for the year. And it also has some basic summaries of the data, which we looked at at the end of the last video or the first part, uh, the video, the first part of the series. In this video, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the data. Specifically, we'll be looking at the remaining three tabs, which are essentially pivot tables created by Excel. Now again, I'm making the assumption with these videos that you have some basic understanding of Excel and can do basic formulas and know how to create a pivot table. If you're not familiar with pivot tables, you can learn how to use them through Excel's help menu. Essentially, it's a tool that aggregates data based on criteria that you set. Don't get too hung up on creating pivot tables. Excel's help resources are really good. That's how I learned how to create them. And you can get uh, a friend to help you if uh, you don't want to figure it out, or you can just do the calculations manually. Uh, and I have done that in the past. What's more important with this video is that I want you to see how I use the data to make concrete decisions about the best ways to maximize our limited marketing time for the coming year. So the first thing that I look at in terms of revenue is um, looking at the revenue by case type. And I mentioned to you before in the first video that I group all of my client matters um, into one of five categories. And I do that in column L of the, uh, of the uh, worksheet that is in the first tab. The five categories for my firm is contract work, uh, corporate formation work, securities or corporate finance, M&A or mergers and acquisitions, and trademark work. Now, as we discussed before, I track this information um, in the other worksheet. Um, in order to run this report. And the goal of this exercise is to pick the marketing activities that, um, that produces the most revenue. So in order to do that, we'll want to make sure that we know what types of matters that we're servicing in our firm that produce the most revenue. Now, as you can see, the M&A work um, generated the most revenue in 2008 uh, or 36%, followed closely by securities work and then contract work. And then if you look, the corporate formation work and the trademark work um, actually represented a very small amount of our total revenues. And that's mostly reflective of the, the small dollar value of each of those, um, each of each of that work. I mean, a formation work or a trademark work doesn't generate that that much in terms of revenue as compared to M&A or securities work. Now, while M&A and securities work is the most lucrative, I also know that that works the hardest to land. And in 2008, we were going headfirst into the Great Recession, um, and so I needed to really think about it. Now, um, if you just looked at these numbers in a vacuum, you would say, well, let's try to get more securities and M&A work. Um, but, you know, if you looked at this in the context of economic factors, 
um, you know, maybe that wasn't such a great plan. Um, the securities and M&A work is, is done by fewer clients. So um, of the 66 per combined percentage of, of work that our firm did for securities work in M&A, it was probably done with four clients. Um, by comparison, the contract work um, generated almost as much um, revenue as, um, as the securities or the M&A work but it was done by many more clients. So it was almost as lucrative. It's considerably easier to land. It's done with more clients. So the end result is that the loss of any one of those clients wouldn't crush the firm's revenue. So um, for us, we decided for the firm to grow um, that in 2009, we were going to focus more attention on increasing contract work and um, we would maintain our current levels of marketing for M&A and securities work until the economy improved. So in the, the second worksheet or second pivot table that um, I like to run is um, uh, an analysis of how much business each revenue source generated for the year and um, and also how much revenue that source generated since I started tracking those numbers in 2003. So as you can see, um, I have each individual um, referral source listed in column A. Um, in column B, uh, we have the, uh, the, the sum of revenue that that person was responsible for generating in, um, in 2008, and then also as part of that same report grouped together, is the sum uh, that they have done since the lifetime of doing business with them. Now, if you remember, at the end of the first video series, I told you how valuable I found information about clients who do repeat business. And uh, we talked a little bit about how um, this information here was very important to me in terms of the number of clients that repeated from the previous year and the percentage of clients that repeated from the previous year. Now, I also know that I happen to have a law practice where um, we have clients that do repeat business with us, but many of you don't. So, um, for example, an immigration lawyer or a, uh, a matrimonial lawyer is not likely, hopefully, to get repeat business from their clientele. So for those practitioners whose clients are not likely to do repeat business, for you, Knowing which of your referral sources are likely to send repeat business and in what amount is going to be how you predict what your revenues are going to be in the coming year. Um, so this is going to be perhaps a more important uh, analysis of your client revenue data than um, what we had discussed at the end of the previous video. So how I use this report is I look at who sent business last year and who's likely to send business in the coming year. Um, I also happen to know that most of my referral sources are attorneys, so I paid careful attention um, to what each attorney on the list sent in the previous year and, um, and then how I could potentially nurture that relationship in the next year. So I've got three examples that I've highlighted for you here. Um, you'll notice in the different shades of blue, we have um, Amir and we have Amy. Um, both Amir and Amy are, are lawyers, and um, if you'll notice that Amir had sent a fair amount of business previously over the lifetime of our relationship um, with each other, and did send some business last year. So um, then you'll have Amy, who um, 2008 was the first year that we started doing business together, and it was reasonably significant. She sent a $10,000 piece of business. Um, so. When I looked at this, um, my thought process was, well, I bet if I paid more attention to Amir through the course of the year and could get him some business, that I could probably turn that $3,400 in revenue um, you know, into something more substantial since there was already a proven relationship between us in terms of referrals. Um, and then in terms of Amy, um, it was a natural fit. While it was a new relationship, I felt that there was some value there, and she also worked in a practice area where I can send a fair amount of business. Um, and so those were two relationships that I wanted to pay close attention to uh, and really 
make an extra effort in 2009 to nurture those relationships. The last thing I wanted to point out to you, and it was something that um, after I had gone back, I hadn't looked at this in a while, um, and, and started looking at the numbers. Um, in 2008, we actually it was a it was the first full year of um, of doing business at law firm suites. And as it turns out, um, you know, we uh, practice what we preach, and um, over twenty nine thousand dollars in in our firm's revenues came from the other lawyers at law firm suites. So um, it really does pay to share space with other attorneys. And the interesting thing is, uh, at the time, um, it was when we first got started. There were only twelve lawyers in the space besides me and and the lawyers at my firm. Um, so I was able to do. Um, you know, a fair amount of business, certainly enough to pay the rent for the year, um, just from my colleagues. So part of our plan for 2009 was going to be nur to nurture the relationships for the other lawyers uh, who were my suite mates in law firm suites. So from this information, um, I generally look for the sources that have sent the most business, who are likely to continue to send business, and those people to whom I can refer business. Because as you know, referrals are a two-way street. And um, if you're taking, taking, taking and don't give back, um, it's not likely that that person is going to continue sending you business. Um, so for, for the sources that meet that criteria, I spent or allocated the most networking time to in the coming year. And not only networking time, but those are the people who, when I'm out networking, I will be actively looking for cases to try to send, send to them, um, so uh, not only for cases for myself. Um, for everyone else, I keep in touch with, I keep them on my newsletter list, they'll get a, a call or an email from me a few times a year. And I'll refer them cases as they come up, but I won't be out there actively looking for cases. So the last tab that we're going to look at is the lead, sor lead source category tab or report that I run. Now for my practice, this tends to be where I get the most valuable information about the performance of my firm's marketing channels. Um, and if you remember in the first video, I told you that I group every individual lead source into one of 12 categories. And um, if you recall, I do this in column J on the first worksheet tab. Now for us, each one of these categories is largely um, one of our marketing channels. And in this report, uh, I track the amount of money and the percentage of revenue that each category yielded in 2008 um, and here I show it as a percentage of revenue. Um, and I also do it um, for uh, the lifetime of, um, of that category since the firm started. And I also, um, for convenience sake, I, I, um, I include the, the percentage of the total revenue for the previous year as well because I like to see what happens year to year. Um, now, um, I also look at this information, the actual hard revenue numbers, uh, which would actually be in, in column C, which I've hidden because I, I didn't want to share that information. Um, so um, I'll walk you through now um, how I look at these numbers and how I make marketing decisions um, from these numbers. And, and I can tell you it was off of this report that I made the biggest discovery about our old marketing plans and how we were, wa how we were wasting a colossal amount of time and how we learned to fix it. So, um, you know, as I mentioned before, 2008 was the start of the Great Recession and it was a real terrible year for revenues. Um, we lost three major clients as a result of the, of the recession. And so this category, existing client, is uh, revenues that were done um, by, uh, pre by existing clients during, during 2008. And as you can see, there was a big drop off from 2007 to 2008, we only did 7.8 uh, percentage. 7.8 percent of our total revenues in 2008 came from existing clients, whereas in 2007 it was 46 percent, and over the lifetime of the firm, it's 30 percent, which is about, you know, average. 
Um, so it was it was a terrible year for us in terms of repeat business from client, and it really reflected on our revenues. Um, an interesting thing also that we learned this year was um, we were spending a fair amount of time networking with accountants. And, um, you know, common knowledge is that accountants and lawyers are good networking partners. But um, you can see from the numbers here that um, both historically and in 2008 that they're, they're not for us. Um, and despite a fair amount of business that we send to accountants through the course of the year, it doesn't really seem to come back to us. And in 2008, you know, less than 4% of our revenues were generated from referrals from accountants. So we really backed away from doing any kind of active networking with, um, with accountants in, in 2009. Um, a, a highlight of uh, marketing, our marketing strategy from 2008 was, um, was the internet marketing that we were doing. Um, in 2007, we made a pretty significant investment in internet marketing that seemed to pay off in 2008. So 2007, 5 .2, only 5.2% of our revenues um, were generated through the web, whereas 18.5% um, were generated in 2008. So that, that was a good um, increase, and that was an area where we maintained and, in fact, um, allocated more resources and time to um, to do in marketing. We, we were doing well with internet marketing in 2008. Um, I'd mentioned to you before when we were talking about the, uh, the, the lead source um, tables that um, lawyers are, you know, far and wide the best uh, referral source for our firm. And um, you could see that re reflected here that um, that you know, lawyers from outside of law firm suites referred in 18.3% um, of our our revenues, and hi historically 30% of our revenues through the course of our, through the course of a year, and um, and then when you combine that with the um, the revenues that we did from uh, from the lawyers and law firm suites, that represented uh, nearly a third of 2008 revenues. So. Um, so it was a one. It was the one and only bright spot of uh, the result of any networking that we were doing was networking with other lawyers, um, and uh, we'll, we'll get into um, networking in a second. Um, and um, before I get into that, though, I want to talk about um, the legal referral service. So we, we were members of the legal refer, referral service at the at the city bar. Um, and honestly, it generated so little in the form of revenue that I ended up terminating the, the uh, subscription shortly after 2008. Um, honestly, it didn't even pay for the membership fee and the amount of administration time that it took to continue to be a member. Um, and so it, it really just didn't pay to stay involved. So I, I mentioned to you that we found... Um, uh, the, the biggest discovery that we made by looking at this report, um, and, and, and it was an area where we were wasting the most amount of time, and that was actually um, doing networking. Um, you know, when I looked at the numbers, um, apart from networking that was being done directly with lawyers, um, all of the other networking that we were doing, and it was a lot. Um, amounted to only 7.1% of the firm's revenues. So in 2008 and 2007, I belonged to this BNI style networking group that um, took up a lot of my time. There were weekly meetings and house calls, and you know the members of the group wanted you to meet their networking contacts. So it was almost every day I was spending an hour to two hours a day on networking activities. Now. I could tell you, it made me feel like I was doing something really productive, um, but in reality, I was not. And um, it, it ended up being a, a colossal waste of time. And as we were planning our, our marketing for 2009, I more or less dropped all of the networking that I was doing with the exception of... Um, of networking with attorneys and I took a lot of that time and I devoted it towards fostering and nurturing relationships with my suite mates at law firm suites because it was an easy source to meet 
new lawyers. Now, um, an interesting part of this um, analysis was um, I, I had generate about a quarter of the business in 2008 um, that we did from my personal contacts. And it, it was, it's actually one of these situations where um, this was somewhat of an anomaly. It was um, one piece of business that was referred to by a family member um, and uh, it was uh, an M&A transaction and we, re we represented the target. So, um, you know, the, our client was being acquired. We didn't expect to do more business with them and I didn't expect any more business to be sent from our family member. That, that was the, the one big case that we were going to get. Now, on the one hand, <clears throat> that piece of business really saved our year in 2008. Um, but on the other, I, I couldn't count on that in 2009 to generate much um, much in the way of results. So as you're looking at your data, you know, you've got to factor in, you know, one-time anomalies and, you know, make a, a real analysis as to whether or not you can repeat that scenario in the coming year. And if you can't, then you've got to move in a different direction. And then finally, um, an, another bright spot in our um, in our analysis of uh, lead source categories was speaking. And um, in, uh, in 2008, um, we, about 7.5% of our, our business was generated through um, speaking initiatives. And um, it was roughly double um, what we had done the year before. Now, it's not a high percentage of, um, of our business. However, um, I only did two speaking engagements in 2008. And uh, it took me a couple of hours to prepare for it in advance and a couple of hours to attend the event and a couple of hours um, to do the follow-up work. Now, um, you know, so essentially in, in two billable days, what amounted to two billable days worth of um, work, I did more business than in the, um, in, in, in the all the time that I had spent um, doing, you know, this BNI style networking group. So, um, in 2009, we made a, a real concerted effort to increase the amount of speaking that we were doing. And it really, it ended up paying off in a very big way. Um, I mean, speaking, unlike networking is a one to many marketing endeavor. And what that means is that, um, for the same amount of time that you'd spend on a one-on-one -on -one marketing um, activity like networking, um, you you can get your message and build trust with many people um, in a much shorter amount of time. And so the theory is that um, you can generate significantly better results, exponentially better results, by engaging in one-to-many marketing campaigns. Um, so that was the, the biggest shift that we made in our, um, in our marketing strategy uh, for 2009 off of the analysis that we did in, in 2008. We did um, significantly more speaking. So as a recap from this review for 2009, um, we decided from the case type tab to maintain our marketing levels for M&A and securities work, but really um, spend a lot of time looking for contract work. From the lead source category, we picked the top five referral sources and we um, spent a lot of time nurturing those relationships. Um, and uh, additionally, um, we spent a lot of time nurturing relationships with um, our suite mates at, at law firm suites. Now, from the lead source category um, analysis, we decided to drop all of our networking activities unless it involved networking with other lawyers, um, which, uh, as we said, included um, increasing, re increasing our efforts to uh, obtain referrals to our suite mates at law firm suites. And uh, in addition to increasing our um, one-to-many marketing strategies like PR and speaking. And, um, you know, look, as you know, 2009 was not a banner year for the economy. Um, but for us, these changes helped us keep our heads above water. And, um, and in 2009, we, we replaced the revenue 
um, that we we lost um, from those three gigantic clients. Um, but we did it in a much better a much better way. Um, we did it with uh, a higher volume of clients, even though that the um, the uh, average engagement value was lower. Um, but it put us in a position where um, if we lost any one client, it wouldn't cause financial ruin. Thanks for hanging in there with me. I know this was a lot of information. If perfecting your law firm's marketing strategy is something that you spend a lot of time thinking about, then you'd be in good company with the other self-employed attorneys who make law firm suites the home for their law practice. We'd love to introduce you to some of them and also show you around our office. Just book a tour through our website, www.lawfirmsuites.com. If you have any questions about this material, you can reach me on Twitter on at Stephen Fernari, or you can leave a comment below. See you next time.